I've been in this sector for quite a while. And in 2000, we started doing the first studies at the University of California, Irvine, with embryonic stem cells. So I'm originally from the embryonic stem cell sector, then I actually migrated, uh, and my specialty is actually neurobiology and spinal cord injury, believe it or not, anatomy, neurobiology, and spinal cord injury. Um, then I actually went into the adult stem cell sector, and then in general, cells, because cells are fascinating. Everybody spends, uh, I've already come, I'm over stem cells, actually, to be honest with you. I'm more into cell therapy, this is cell therapy. What we're discussing is cell therapy uh, in general. And we're going to go over some of the questions I heard out there uh, a little while ago was talking about differences between one thing and another, one cell and another cell. And we're going to go over that in a lot more detail, look at some studies. And so you get a better understanding of some of the literature that's out there, what's going on out there. And first and foremost, um, you're going to hear some stuff that's repetitive. But remember in college, we all forgot about cells, what they do. Does everybody remember what you know ribosomes do? And do you remember that kind of stuff? But it's funny because you have to think of these things a lot of times when you are um, working with patients and when you are working with cells and when you're trying to think if a patient is, um, is this patient a good candidate? So you gotta think of the function of what's transpiring with what you're using first and foremost because this is personalized medicine. Everybody's, every single body in here is completely different. One has a headache and takes Tylenol and it works phenomenal. The other one has to take ibuprofen and the other one just drinks a cup of coffee and it's gone because we're all different. We're all unique in, in, in our own way. So remember cells is the basic unit of life. It is. It's the building block for every single thing that we have in our body, every single thing that transpires in our body. There is nothing more important than a single cell in our body and it's a single cell working with all the other cells together and making changes in our body on a daily basis and reacting on a daily basis and this requires communication between one cell and another cell without communication from one cell nothing transpires to the other cell the other cell needs signals and the other cell loves its partner and loves the other person that's next to it. And these are things that you need to think of when you're thinking about, for instance, one of the last questions I heard was quantity of cells. Um, you know, if you just try to throw in one cell or a lot of times just one cell type and it's not in the right location, it's difficult for that cell to react the right way because these cells, as you will see later on, the take home message of all of this that I'm gonna talk about is what is being secreted by these things, how they work as signalers and how they react and how they make your own endogenous system do the right thing and help you heal, help you repair, help oxygenation, control the immune response because there's nothing more important than the immune system, right? So cells in itself, not only do we discuss proteins that they secrete, but remember, Without an extracellular matrix, a cell has nothing. It has nowhere to live. The number one ab abundant protein in your body is collagen. The second one is hyaluronic acid. Without collagen or with any form of deficiencies in collagen, you will definitely have, besides cell problems, you will have tissue problems and you will have a lot of problems in your body. Uh, the joint itself, for instance, orthopedics. Orthopedics basically require a consistent flow of synovial fluid, which is hyaluronic acid, uh, and this is what cells secrete. We're going to digress a little bit and go back to, you might have heard this before, but that's okay. The take-home picture is you're going to hear things repetitively, and it's going to be put in your head so you understand this well, um, and you know this. So adult stem cells, you can obtain these from almost anywhere uh, in your body. It's crazy from how many places you can obtain them. I actually have a publication from 2009 that from a male biopsy, a one millimeter male biopsy, we can actually obtain mesenchymal stem cells and a pure population of them and culture expand them, change them and do everything just like it's a true mesenchymal stem cell. These cells have to be able to self renew. They have to be potent. They have to be able to differentiate and we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail. And the stem cells that we contain in our body are hemopoietic stem cells, which is considered like the, mud, the mother, the mother of blood stem cell and the mesenchymal stem cell. The mesenchymal stem cell is, of course, of mesodermal origin, and it's located throughout the body. These cells are multipotent. 
I do not want to hear anybody saying an adult stem cell is pluripotent because when we discuss pluripotency, we discuss an embryonic cell type or we discuss what's called an inducible pluripotent stem cell and it can be problematic. That's one of the biggest concerns with these is as these cells can actually differentiate into any cell in the body. At the same time, they could possibly go array. They could cause what's called, you know, teratomas, this kind of stuff, and they could be problematic. It's hard to differentiate or change those cells into a pure cell, into one specific pure cell type. You change that cell, that's a very, very naive cell, into, for instance, some of the work we did was into an oligodendrocyte, so it can remyelinate in the central nervous system. You want to change it into, for instance, a cardiomyocyte. But the issue is changing those in a very, very high efficiency is a little bit difficult, meaning high efficiency is 99% pure, 95% pure. It's relatively difficult to do this kind of work. The vast majority of stem cells you will hear out there are from umbilical cord blood and tissue. Those are two different fountains, completely different, even though they're from one source. Adipose tissue which adipose tissue is from you, so remember that is autologous, it's an autologous cell source, and that's contained from you, um, which what you're actually using there is not necessarily a fat, but you're obtaining from fat a thing called stromovascular fraction, which is a heterogeneous population of cells that contains a small fraction of stem cells. So it's not that it's bad, it's a good cell, it's a great cell to use, but it's not a pure stem cell. And then bone marrow, very same exact type of thing, similar, where you do bone marrow extraction, you obtain what's called the Buffy coat, and this contains polymorphonuclear cells, it contains mononuclear cells in there, white cell type. So about 1% of the, the bone marrow you obtain, just like blood when you do hematocrit. And from there, you have a vast different types, a bunch of different cell types. The two cell types that we talk about in autologous, I heard the question earlier, is these cells are as old as you are. Um, and we'll discuss those in a little bit more detail when we go along. From umbilical cord blood, remember, very similar to bone marrow, the blood, we obtain a mononuclear cell fraction, or Buffy coat too. And it's similar to bone marrow, but of course, much more naive, much younger, and we're gonna discuss logistics of that. And then from tissue, there are predominantly some cell types in there, but there's some stem cells in there that in the ideal situation, if you're gonna use that cell source, you got to culture expand these to actually obtain a pure stem cell type from them. So this is a summary of all the different places that you can actually obtain uh, stem cells from. And I've probably worked with almost every one of these different tissue uh, sources except pancreas. Um, Jesus, that's, that's probably the only one that I haven't worked on. And, and actually retina I haven't worked on too. But I've been fortunate to work on almost any cell type you can actually think of uh, if in the body from adult. So we're gonna go into a lot more details of mesenchymal stem cells. You may have heard this before. We're gonna go into a little bit more detail though on this. Um, you know, this is the present standard of mesenchymal stem cell. This present standard is old. It may sound as new to you, but this is from 2006. And this was actually determined by Dominici et al, their Italian group, really, really nice gentleman. I see him once a year in Spain at this conference I go to. And it's, it, it's, it's an, a concept of People were starting discussing the cell. There's quite a bit of data out there on this cell, which the cell was originally found by Friedenstein in 1974. But then Kaplan took over uh, in the 1990s and named the cell, characterized the cell in a lot more detail. But the criteria is that these things have to adhere to plastic. What is that? That's the number one criteria. This thing needs to be able to bind to a petri dish to simplify it for you. When cells bind to a petri dish, they're able to multiply and they're able to divide. Um, if you take, for instance, bone marrow, or if you take umbilical cord blood, either one of those two, um, you will see a bunch of cells, the vast majority of cells will actually float. And it's because a lot of these are immune cells. Immune cells don't adhere. They're not adherent to what we call, I may, by the way, I'm, I mean, like I said, I was a PhD. I grew up cells, so I know what these cells look like. And they don't adhere, they just float and they still propagate as they float, but the adherent ones are mesenchymal stem cells. They are MSCs, and there are other cell types in there that adhere. For instance, endothelial cells adhere. Uh, when you grow up endothelial cells, which is a very, very important cell type, we'll discuss a little bit more that's in these 
uh, cord blood, in bone marrow. These cells release vascular endothelial growth factor, which is really, really important because what does this do? This helps increase vascularization. It does what's called angiogenesis in here and what everybody know is known as angiogenesis. And it can increase blood flow, it can form new vasculature, and when we discuss forming new vasculature, we now discuss actually increasing blood flow to another area. So if you think about this aspect of it, and you think of patients that have some form of occlusion, stroke, heart, uh, chronic um, limb ischemia, uh, peripheral artery disease, this cell type may work really, really well for that. But anyway, these cells have to be positive for these markers, 105. These are markers that are located on the outside of a cell. These are proteins that are located on the outside of the cells, 105, 73, and 90. And they have to be negative. This is when you are producing a pure mesenchymal stem cell. Only a pure mesenchymal stem cell that's done in culture. Remember, this has to grow up. You've now modified the product, and it's a uh, product that's, that's actually grown. So, it's negative for 34. That's a blood marker. That's the purpose of it. This is a hemopoietic stem cell marker, CD34. CD45 is found on leukocytes, on all leukocytes. CD1411, specifically a marker for a specific type of, of leukocyte, CD19, which is B cells. And one thing that's really, really important on this is HLADR. HLADR labels for MHC class II molecules. It has to be negative for that or it has to be negligible. The reason being is that a cell type can be positive for what's called MHC class I, which is HLA, ABC, but it cannot be because that's part of, remember, let's think back to our biology days, that is part of the innate immune response. The innate is your immediate immune response. The one that causes problems, graft-versus-host disease and other problems, autoimmune disease, is your secondary or your adaptive immune response. MHC class II is part of that secondary response. That's why it has to be negative. So what this is telling you with that is that you can take these cells, I can produce these cells from any one of you here, and as long as it's a pure population, I can put it into your neighbor. And as long as we've tested it well, which we'll go into testing parameters and all that in a little bit, then I can actually put it into your neighbor, and in the ideal situation, it'll work fine. Most importantly, you have to be able to change these cells into which is, this is a publication I have from 2007 myself. And you gotta be able to take these cells and change them into criteria is bone. So on your, uh, sorry, on your left, you will see a control panel, meaning this stuff um, has not been induced to change into any one of these tissue types. And on your right, you will see an induced product. And you'll see bone, and what that is is an alizarin red uh, stain that stains for calcium deposit. You look at this underneath the microscope and you'll see this sort of like mineralization on there. It's pretty neat. The second one is cartilage. And what do we look at when we look at cartilage? We look at chondroitin sulfates or we look at proteoglycans. This particular is what's called an alcyon blue stain. And it stains for um, proteoglycans is what we're looking for. And lastly, you can see all the fat droplets mm -hmm. that are floating on top of the cells that have released these fast, fat droplets. It has to be able to change into that which is basically a oil red oil stain. It's an oil stain that actually goes against a, a liquid, so you can actually see the fat droplets well. This defines this particular cell type. Like I said, you can isolate this from bone marrow fat, dental pulp, umbilical cord tissue. These are the adult cell sources that you'll see a lot. Placenta, synovial tissue, testes is one that we talked about. These are highly expandable, meaning I can expand a lot of these and produce these in a large amount, in an abundance. Okay, without losing their ability to change into these different cell sources. So they maintain a, just their, their, their natural source. However, as you replicate these, these age substantially, you will see. Uh, these, that's due because of aging, disease, and actually the culture, to, the, the, what you put them in, the food you put them in, can change them substantially. It's actually a really, really important component of it. We spend some time, and I'll show you some data that we have uh, on it looking at maintaining stemness, looking at making sure the telomeres are shorter on them so they can actually multiply and, and, and they, they, they maintain somewhat what's called their plasticity. But they, these cells are not really designed um, to produce a tissue. You know, everybody thinks, you know, you take a stem cell, you put it inside, and you can replicate an organ, or that's not the case. You know, these cells are designed to signal um, is their primary 
uh, work. And this is their therapeutic activity of these particular cells. They can modulate the local immune system. So they can inhibit actually surveillance of other damaged tissues. Uh, they can inhibit autoimmune responses and inflammatory responses. And they do so, which we'll show some data in a little while, by basically shifting the response of what's called a pro-inflammatory response, which is a Th1 response, to a Th2, which is an anti-inflammatory response. That's one aspect. And another one is actually by upregulating in your body what's called a CD25 regulatory T cell. Uh, it's a really, really important cell type that we have in our body that surveils on a regular basis. Uh, this thing has a lot of trophic of effects, meaning it releases a cargo of a lot of different things, depending on where it is and how it needs to react. It can inhibit apoptosis, prevent scar formation, stimulate angiogenesis, uh, form perivascular contacts to you know, stabilize new blood vessels, uh, secrete different mitogens, meaning mitogens actually cause proliferation of cells so you have a, a healing aspect of it. Remember, skin turns over on a daily basis. The more you turn over skin, a lot of times the younger the appearance, and that's basically the concept in a lot of, of cosmetics. And it has an antimicrobial protection too, a couple of different molecules that are now seen, and that's actually looked at a lot more. We're not gonna go too much into the antimicrobial aspects of it, but when these things are stress injured, um, they secrete these factors that cause activation of a bunch of different things. You know, they can defend against autoimmunity, and it's what Kaplan actually referred to, actually a long time ago, as to a curtain that they can actually do. And they actually have a localized zone of regeneration. So what transpires, for instance, when you normally inject into an area, and the concept is basically the cell, or the body, your body has a distress signal. And this distress signal is somewhat, let's say, like a ligand or a protein that's calling out, or what I simplify it as a key. And then the cell has a receptor that it actually finds a way to go to the lock because it's, it's a perfect sequence, it's a perfect combination. I need to go here, I need to deal with that. They, it binds to that area, and then once it binds to that area and once it's localized to that area, it now has its mode of action that I can work. And the way it works is by releasing all these different factors, you know, so, and these factors, these are sort of, for instance, recruitments of how they're recruited, signalers that they use. Stromal cell derived factor is one of them, uh, MCP3, CXCL9, CXCL16, CCL20. These are different chemokines. Chemokines are chemical releasers that cause a cell to migrate to where it needs to go and do the job that it needs to uh, go. So they home the sites of inflammation and actually injury sites also. And they actually do that in response to specific inflammatory markers. So interleukin-1, pro-inflammatory marker, interleukin-2, 12, all of these. Most importantly is tumor necrosis factor alpha and IFN gamma. Those two molecules right there are the strongest problematic markers in your body. TNF-alpha directly, there's a direct correlation with TNF-alpha, HSCRP, uh, high-sensitive uh, CRP, and IL-6 with, believe it or not, morbidity, mortality, heart problems, Alzheimer's, dementia, all the above. Um, and I'm assuming they should, sooner or later, that sh this should actually should be a standard of care for testing on aged individuals, or as you age, because these are definitely markers of problems that are to come. These cells react to it by countering and releasing other things is what they basically do. They release other factors such as this. So prostaglandin 2, uh, transforming growth factor beta 1, uh, hepatic cell growth factor, stromal derived factor 1, nitric oxide, believe it or not, interleukin 4, 6. Interleukin 6 has sort of like a dual role a pro-inflammatory role and an anti-inflammatory role. But mostly, in a lot of cases, is actually detrimental. Uh, most important, one of the things you will see here, IL-1-RA is probably the strongest anti-inflammatory. It's also called IRAP. And this thing is what actually mitigates TNF-alpha or stops it or keeps it in control in your body. And this is not only released by stem cells, but it's actually released by other cell types. And a lot of these that you will see here are not only released by stem cells, and I need you to understand that, it's really important. They're released by a lot of cells in your body. 
These are how these cells react. It's just a couple of different diagrams of different specific cells. You know, they have a target of a dendritic cell, of immature dendritic cell, T cells, for instance, CD4 positive ones and helper T cells. Helper T cells are the ones that remember your old days, you had an infection, a bad infection, the innate immune system came in and tried to do some help. Uh, cells are actually then targeted and these guys actually are the ones that become clones. Eventually when the clone is gone and the problem is gone, you now have you know, some cells that are left over which are the regulatory T cells that now surveil. This is how vaccines work, of course. You're given the a small protein of it. And you have a regulatory T cell that now surveils that can immediately react. This is why you don't get uh, you know, another problem again when you've been vaccinated. Uh, T cells, CD8 T cells, which are cytotoxic Ts. These are T cells that actually directly kill and deal with cells. And then regulatory T cells, which are probably one of the most important cell types. And there's a lot more studies on these cells looking at autoimmune diseases. Uh, there's actually a group in Texas that's actually specifically focused on ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease and regulatory T cells, because there's a quite a bit of evidence that individuals that have ALS, specific forms of it, if there's too much of uh, what's called FOXP3, it's a specific protein, and upregulation of T regulatory T cells, then they can actually deal with them possibly, uh, of that protein, they can actually deal with them by expanding regulatory T cells and keeping regulation of the immune system uh, on them. B cells, they can act directly on B cells, natural killer cells, which is one of my favorite cells uh, in the world that I work with quite a bit, uh, monocytes, macrophages, neutrophils, and sometimes no specific target, meaning reaction to a specific um, something that's out there, a protein that's out there of interest, and then actually just having an effect. You know, the most important thing is actually the effect. For instance, on the bottom one that you see no specific target, a downregulation of T cell proliferation, a downregulation of IFN gamma, which is secreted by what's what we call Th1 uh, cells, which are pro-inflammatory cells. The concept is to modulate the immune system. There's nothing more important than modulating your immune system. Every single disease in our body has an inflammatory and immune system component to it. So it's the most important thing uh, that we have. These cells do not express, like we said, class two major histocompatibility complexes or co-stimulatory molecules to begin with. They express low levels of MHC class one or HLA-ABC. And what this does is it allows us to use them from one individual to another individual without issues. So much so that such a product um, has been approved in Canada for pediatric graft versus host. So they use this to suppress the immune system in pediatric graft versus host. It's actually a very, very expensive therapy. Um, they inhibit, like I said, T cell expansion and lymphocyte reactions. Uh, they basically avoid the immune system is what they do. So they're not seen by the immune system. They're trophic effects, anti-scarring effects. They actually do this by secreting these factors, keratinocyte growth factor, stromal cell derived factor. Um, they prevent the scar formation via paracrine effect. This is a signaling of the cell to another cell or signaling in a localized area. And this is how you get actually, believe it or not, a reduction of, of, of scarring. Macrophage inflammatory protein one alpha and one beta. Both of these are directly dealing with, you know, of course, removing tissue, remodeling tissue, and they deal directly with, um, you know, the anti-scarring effects of them, of that. Oops. Sorry, there's something wrong and something missing here. <laughs> So they actually deal with actually um, anti-apoptosis. So they can actually stop apoptosis in a cell. They have an anti-apoptotic property to them. And the concept behind that is remember, the more and more cell tur turnover that you have in your body a lot of times, the more you age. We have a finite amount of cell divisions in our body. And eventually these cells divide, 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 and they become senesced, aged, old, which is everything from gray hair, wrinkles, fibrosis of the lung, liver, et cetera, et cetera. It's a problem. So if you think about it in that aspect, then we also think about possibly an anti-aging uh, in, this, in this case. Here's some of the things that, you know, vascular endothelial growth factor, which, which dis we discuss. This is really, really important um, in increasing blood flow and oxygenation to our body. Because if you don't have this, you don't have healing. As we age, remember, our arteries, 
et cetera, actually narrow substantially, and we get a lack of vasculature. We can't heal as well because the correct nutrients are actually not going, getting to where they need to go. You know, individuals that do these type of therapies a lot of times, I mean, I've seen individuals that they told them, you need to amputate a limb, and you can see the vasculature before, and then they get these treatments done, and then after these treatments are done, you can see the massive increase of vasculature, and then you're talking about somebody that no longer has to have, for instance, a leg amputated, can now walk without pain and has no issue. So it's a change of quality of life. It's never a cure. None of these things are a cure. Please don't ever sell any of this stuff or ever discuss any of this stuff that it's a cure because it's not a cure. It's never been a cure. And I find it difficult that it'll be a cure. Nobody's actually demonstrated that it is a cure so far. So it can reverse apoptosis through, like what we said, um, endothelial cells, you know, and specifically releasing specific growth factors uh, that it does. Most important aspect is, you know, besides the immune effect, angiogenesis, what we just described, increasing blood flow, directly acting with angio point one, which is one of the factors that actually permeabilizes the endothelial cell barrier, barrier as blood is flowing through there, uh, through our body. So cells can migrate and go to where they need to go and then form new vascularization, uh, epidermal growth factors that, you know, that other chemokines that's, you know, that, that are included in there, epidermal growth factor, and IGF-1, which we all know really well, um, that does a lot with making changes in your body, which decreases substantially as we age. The mitogenic effects, when we discuss mitogenic effect, is basically ability to cause younger cells to divide and cause cells that are, that are stagnant and not doing much to actually divide and do the right thing. This is actually mediated by all these different factors that you see here. Predominantly, one of the strongest one is FGF2. This is actually one that we use quite a bit in cell culture to maintain proliferation and to maintain cells relatively young. It originally started out that this is one of the strongest factors in the embryonic sector. Um, and it's one that's the most used in vitro that we use, but now we can actually measure this, which we do a lot of times in blood samples and whatnot. And we can see once you've put these cells or use specific factors in there, we can see an upregulation of this particular protein that is beneficial for you. In a nutshell, when we discuss mechanism of action, this is a really, really nice graph that puts all of it in play. Absolutely all of it. And these cells are derived from parasites, which the one that determined this was also Arnold Kaplan. And these are basically ready to migrate into the endothelium and into the, into the vasculature. They're loosely attached once they're ready to go as an MSC. They free themselves up, they become activated, and start working on specific mechanisms of all these different um, factors that you see, and they'll start releasing all these. These are all the trophic effects. And then what ends up happening with all these different tro trophic effects, whether it's anti-scarring, anti-apoptotic, angiogenic, mitogenic, um, immune modulatory, or antimicrobial, these are the two different factors so far that we know that act on specific um, bacterium. And then they actually reestablish the microenvironment. The concept is basically to go to a homeostasis, to become, have an area that becomes homeostatic again, and then the, the problem can actually um, hopefully go away if we've, we've treated it the right way. So these regenerative medicine products are obtained from immune cells, endothelial cells, stem cells. These are regenerative medicine products, okay? Not just MSCs. When we talk about different products that are out there, uh, the only way you obtain this mesenchymal stem cell is remember once again from you proliferating that cell and you demonstrating that you can adhere to plastic. However, all these cells that you see up here all have a beneficial effect. From fat, you obtain immune cells, endothelial cells, stem cells, other cell types that are in there. From birthing tissue, matrix, stem cells, endothelial cells, these other cells. But remember, in all these products, when we discuss stem cells, it's in a very small frequency. But no matter what, we are dis we're, dis we're discussing regenerative medicine. Because your immune system, remember, before there was stem cells, before there was anything else, there was really nothing, right? And there was no discuss of stem cells doing anything. There was discuss of when you cut yourself, what helps regenerate everything? What's the start? The start is the immune system. The immune system is the mo most important cell that you have 
uh, in your body, whether it's detrimental, whether it's healing, whether it's not, it reacts the way it needs to. Let's start discussing a little bit more allogeneic products and so we can actually differentiate uh, products, one product from another product. Umbilical cord blood itself uh, is something that has been used for much greater than 40 years in the umbilical cord blood industry, as you know. And the original concept was basically, of course, reconstitution of the hemopoietic system. But as time has progressed and science has progressed, uh, this stuff is actually being used for a lot more than just that. And it makes complete sense that it can help. Uh, the interesting thing is back, there's a couple publications from a really, really long time ago where they would take, uh, they had a shortage of blood and they needed to do blood transfers from, from children. And all they did was ABO type and pure umbilical cord blood and they use this as transfusion to other patients and it was completely safe for blood transfusion into children. Um, this product, so I said, like it, it contains stem cells, immune cells, endothelial cells, um, and a high abundance of what's called human vein endothelial cells, which we call UVAC cells. The two different stem cells that are in there are a blood stem cell and a mesenchymal stem cell. They've been used for a really, really long time and they're safe in, any, in, in a lot of various different uh, diseases. And they've been shown to be a better source for allogeneic transplant than bone marrow. The reason being is because they engraft much better and a better efficiency. So why umbilical cord blood? Here's a simple publication right here where they look at differences between uh, mesenchymal stem cells that are obtained from umbilical cord blood, bone marrow, and the stromal vascular fraction. And what they ended up doing was looking at it in a lung model in an animal. What they found was there was a benefit when the largest benefit actually, when they actually used the allogeneic product versus using the autologous product because of one specific factor and they pinpointed one specific factor that we actually talked about a little while ago and that's ANG1 because what it basically did was increase blood flow to the lungs is the hypothesis and we now had much more of a what's called the healing trophic effect uh, that it was able to do. And they demonstrated that too by actually blocking, to make sure that that was a mechanism that they found, they actually blocked ANG1 and they actually saw no effect, uh, which is right here in, one of, in this graph right down here, on there. So continuing on with why using another cell versus your own cell has to do with several things, age of cells, disease, and the properties and also clinical work out there. So take a look at this nice little graph. Do you remember your hand when you were uh, 20? I don't know, my hand's not quite to that other one on the right, but or on the left, to, on the right to you guys too. But anyway, you know, this is what transpires over time. And the reason why I put this up here is because this right here is an umbilical cord MSC. And you can see these are nice little triangular smaller cells that run in the range of about 12 microns, 14 microns. As you divide these cells up and continue to propagate them, they age just like we age. They age in, in vitro in a artificial environment. But this is actually not an after. This is actually from a 40 year old at the same time point as this time point right here. Much larger, much more stressed. Some of them actually look like they're actually senesced. Uh, for instance, I can, on my screen, I can see it, but it's a little hard to see. Right here, there's a very, very wide one. Um, and that wide one right there is what we call almost like a senesce cell, that it no longer has the correct function, it doesn't work right. The difference between this and this is, I can probably grow this up, I can obtain about 90 population doublings in vitro on this, and this product from a 40 year old, I can obtain about 20 population doublings. The problem is when I'm at about five or six population doublings, I now have a 50, 60 year old cell. And here, when I'm at about 30 population dummies, I still have a 14-year-old cell. That's a big problem with these cells. You can see a spix, uh, you know, here's some work that we've actually done and looked at, where you look at exponential growth of these umbilical cord allogeneic cells, and then these cells are, they're, they're not bad, these are from a 40-year-old, one of them is fat, one of them is bone marrow, um, and they start to ward off and they don't produce as much cells. Most importantly is that when we discuss stem cells and stemness or the ability to replicate itself is the clones that they produce, you know, we do these things that's called, they're CFUs, calling forming units, but they're also called 
limiting dilution assays. And the limiting dilution assays is when you basically played out a control of 10,000 cells and then you just played out 100 cells in one of these plates. That means one cell per centimeter squared, which basically if it's not a stem cell, it's not going to grow. There's no way because it's got to produce a clone of itself. And you can see the difference actually in, you know, this is from a 40-year-old uh, at the fourth passage, uh, bone marrow, his fat, and then the umbilical cord cell, the frequency of these cells, and this is actually the frequency of these cells as they're graphed. So basically as you age, even the, even the youngest of the fatter bone marrow is still not equivalent to the, the, uh, the stemness, so to say, of the oldest of the umbilical cord. Other more important things are telomere measurements, because we look at this and we try to suppress this and keep this under control as we age, and we try to keep this under control actually in culture. And we do this by doing specific feedings using specific foods that we're able to do this. Um, everybody knows what telomeres are, right? Everybody understands what transpires with telomeres. So just a quick update, and I bet a lot of people don't know. So when you, when egg and sperm fuse, we have about five, 15,000, excuse me, 15,000 base pairs. During that nine month development period, 5,000 base pairs are wiped out. You're born with about 10,000 base pairs. So we start off at about 10,000 base pairs. And dura during life, all life, whether you live to 50, 80, 90, 100, you only, believe it or not, wipe out about 5,000 base pairs. And it all depends on everything that you do, diet, et cetera, et cetera. Actually, the only thing that's proven is caloric restriction to maintain telomeres, to increase telomerase activity, uh, this type of thing. Because there is an enzyme that stops cleaving or actually piles on telomeres to stop this aging effect that transpires. And then the other thing you need to understand is not, telomeres are not found in every single cell in your body too. It's only in certain cells in your body. But anyway, as we culture expand these cells and as we propagate them, what we call propagating them out, their telomere lengths are, um, are shortened. Uh, this work, I was fortunate to work with probably the best group in the world. They are the best group in the world with actually measuring telomere attrition. Life linked out of Spain. They are the pioneers and the best in that. Um, and they did work. These are the same exact from, you know, bone marrow from fat. And you can see even at the latest time point that these are maintained at 7,500 base pairs. Even the youngest of bone marrow fat are still much older. You know, and at passage six, like we said, we're starting to get a little bit short and the cells are not going to function uh, as well, including the protective mechanism on, an eight, on a younger cell versus an older cell. Look at this as we get aged, the amount of telomerase that increases telomeres increases substantial. So these cells are secreting this stuff to try to maintain their youth. That's what they do. They work different. They have the ability to secrete a lot more things. I want to give you some instances of some phenomenal work in the autologous sector. But the reason, the purpose behind this is, is so, so you gather a, a basic understanding of hy hypothetically thinking of what can transpire. This work is, there's the two different publications I'm going to discuss here. Um, they're both from the Bird et al. group, which does phenomenal work. These guys basically looked at uh, non-myeloblation. So remember, you're doing a chemotherapy on a patient, on a patient that has multiple sclerosis. 151 patients with relapse remitting MS and then secondary progressive. They did basically a collection of hemopoietic stem cells, so from the you know, bone marrow or either from the peripheral blood. Um, they then collect this. They do a, which is problematic, I mean, there's, there's risk to it, do a non-myeloblation. And then you do basically a bone marrow transplant is what you're basically doing. And what they saw was 41 of the patients approved 50% in their disability up to two years, 23%, 23 patients, excuse me, 64% improvement in disability scale at four years. An overall improvement in many aspects. They continue to do these studies, adding more and more patients on there. Um, but the only issue with this is that if you read the publication well, the patients will revert eventually. And it makes sense if you think about it. You're putting in a naive cell, you're starting them from a younger time point. And the good thing about this is this tells you that the immune system controls a lot. And I'll show you some more evidence that it does. The immune system controls practically everything in your body. Um, and this basically tells you that eventually there's some form of a genetic problem, which we don't know. There's some form of a 
cue or signal as you age or as these cells age that we don't know that causes these disease. Same exact thing, the same group, same exact thing in diabetic diabetes type 1. The great thing is that some of these patients, believe it or not, and these are type 1 diabetics, were insulin free, um, I believe it was up to 48 months. But they all, even the ones that were insulin free, they revert back. So that means that there's something in your own body that is transpiring, there's some form of mutation, there's some form of signal that is problematic, that can be problematic. And this is actually demonstrated when we do studies directly as scientists, and look at this, where in this case, EAE is an uh, experimental autoimmune encephalitis model, and I've worked with that one, another model that's called the HBV model, that actually deals also with MS direct. And these cause debilitating problems in this mice overnight. You're talking about a mouse that can't walk, can't drink, can't do anything. You have to feed them, you have to do everything with them. We take stem cells, we put them in them, and it's like night and day sometimes. It's crazy. I mean, and they'll, they'll get worse and worse and worse, and if you don't take care of them well, they will succumb to the, these, you know, these things that we give them. But the interesting thing is when they obtain a stem cells from fat of that particular mouse, and they put it back into that mouse, it didn't help the mouse very much. But when they took the knockout version, meaning the normal version of that mouse, and they put it into that diseased mouse, the mouse became practically normal. The mouse was able to walk, feed itself, and do everything. So it tells you that there's something wrong with the individual that has an immune problem, that these cells do not work, sorry, that these cells do not work. So much so in this study right here, they took these particular cells from multiple sclerosis patients and from normal patients and they profiled them. And what they found, for instance, was there's a decrease, remember the markers that we discussed, 105, CD3, and there's a decrease actually in immune system cells, expression of these markers. That means that they don't work. Uh, there was 618 different genes that were expressed, that were downregulated, that were not doing the job that they're supposed to do. Remember these genes that we talked about on how these cells work, TGF beta 1, HGF, FGF, um, the pathways were not working correctly. And this means that there's a problem with these individuals that have these autoimmune diseases that we, if we use their own cells, it can be a problem. This was one of the most fascinating articles, and you should, if you, if you please get a chance, pick it up, read it, just type in, uh, he got schizophrenia, he got cured, cancer. It's from the New York Times, and this is amazing, and this definitely demonstrates uh, the power of the immune system because this is an individual that had cancer, um, and when he had cancer, he was cured of his cancer. His brother was his donor. It's an allogeneic transplant. His brother was a donor, and after he was cured of his cancer, his brother had schizophrenia, and then so did he. He got schizophrenia. So that shows you the power of this. Another, another uh, uh, different on this publication that you'll read is, I mean, they discuss a couple different things that are, that are theories out there and therapies, but one individual that had schizophrenia and had cancer, both things, had a transplant from a sibling that did not have schizophrenia and was cured from both, cancer and schizophrenia. So it tells you there's a direct correlation with the immune system, neuro, and we of course also know there's a direct correlation with gut, with neuro also too, because how many times you eat some bad food, you get a massive headache and you feel like crap, right? So why algenaic continue on? These are basically now considered like the gold standard and it's because of the abundance of what they secrete, what they can do, how they work. Um, studies such as stuff show that they're safe. You know, this group right here, I'm actually working with them now out of China. They've actually treated over a thousand patients in an abundance of different of autoimmune diseases with these cell types. And they found the best efficacy uh, with them. This is a publication actually from years ago. Uh, 172 patients, they found no adverse events. Serum levels of memory, what we discussed, TNF-alpha and IL-6 were decreased significantly. The regulatory cells were increased significantly, which is probably one of the most important aspects of it. Remission of disease according to the ACR improvement criteria, DAS-28, and the HAQ scoring on these patients. There's other evidence out there that it works quite a bit, even including there's a, a publication out there that 
It's pretty neat. It discusses using current standards of biologics for autoimmune disease, meaning the anti-CD20s that you see a million commercials on, uh, the anti-TNF alphas that you see a million commercials on with a million different um, side effects on after. And it discusses comparing these with the actually these cell types. And what they find is that you get a similar effect, except you have something that's natural, one. Secondarily, these biologics do not increase the T regulatory response. They're not cytotoxic, they're not problematic, and they don't cause cancer, of, co of course, because you're consistently suppressing your immune system. This doesn't suppress your immune system, it regulates it, is what it actually does. So these things are safe. There's an abundance of articles out there. Um, you know, most large companies use this, and the purpose is because you basically want an off-the-shelf. It, it's hard to, you know, you're still going to have your patient population that no matter what, and there's quite a bit people that say, I do not, not want something else, somebody else's cells inside of me. They worry about genetics, they worry about DNA, they worry about this kind of stuff, and there's still individuals that have that. It works. All across the board, I've seen uh, quite a bit of data out there that all these different cell types actually work. It's just a matter of pinpointing, and like we said, this is personalized medicine, uh, understanding what's going on with your patient, understanding what's the correct thing that you actually wanna do um, for your patients. So in summary, these cells have tremendous regenerative capacity. The greatest amount of data out there in the cell therapeutic field is actually in the mesenchymal stem cell uh, therapy. <laughs> you know, in vitro work and control studies are needed on each regenerative medicine product that is out there. So there's a lot more data that's needed, you know, for these type of things to understand, you know, for instance, the role of these other cells working in cohesion with, for instance, mesenchymal stem cells or in cohesion with hemopoietic stem cells. Because we know for fact, if we combine hemopoietic stem cells with mesenchymal stem cells, the engraftment on reconstitution of the blood system is much higher and it works more, a lot more efficient.